thank you to whoever it was that put in the church used the text for today, found in James 5, 17, was it? The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Well, I think in the KJV says the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And I'm not talking about prayer today, but I am talking about righteousness. There are four questions I want to ask and that I, I, I want to hopefully answer before the end of the service today. How important is righteousness? What is righteousness? How do we get it? And how do we keep it? By way of illustration, I want to... Um, I want to tell you a story this morning. <clears throat> You'll know the story well. It comes from Genesis chapter 18 and verse 19. Did I say Genesis chapter 18 and 19? Right. It's the story of Lot and Abraham. And Lot, as we know, was the nephew to Abraham. And God came to Abraham uh, in his adult life and said, uh, Abraham, I want you to shift out of this comfortable town here, the town of Ur in the Chaldees. And uh, we know it's a comfortable town because archaeologists have found it of recent times and excavated, and it was a very modern city. It had running water and all sorts of other things that we think as, as modern inventions. And, uh, of course, Abraham lived in a permanent home there. They actually found a street called Abram Street. Now, I, I know there would have been more than one Abram that's, that's lived over the period of time, but it could well have been the street where Abram lived. And uh, God said, I want you to shift from here. I want you to buy yourself a tent, and I want you to, um, I want you to go and uh, live in a tent and uh, go to a place where I tell you. And uh, Lot, who loved his uncle Abram, said, I want to go with you. And, and so he did. And... Uh, as they followed the Lord's leading in a nomadic sort of existence, uh, the, hop, the flocks and herds increased in numbers until it got to the point where Abram and Lot said, we have to separate, we've become too big. Our herdsmen are fighting over the use of water and grazing land and so on. And so Abram said to Lot, uh, at this stage they were grazing along the Jordan Valley. Lovely fertile plains where they were and uh, plenty of food for their stock, although, um, as I said, they've now got too big because of that. And uh, Abram made a very generous gesture to the younger man and said, Lot, I'm going to give you first choice. If you choose these uh, nice flat plains here where there's good grazing, that's fine. I don't mind. I'll go up into the foothills there and where the grazing's not so good, but I don't mind. I'll go there. But if you choose the other way, well, I'll go the other way around. Lot being the younger man and, and, and um, uh, his uncle being the senior should have said, no, uncle, you take the flats and I'll take the hills. But Lot showed a, a flaw in his character here. And he said, I quite like the look of the plains. That'll be easy farming. I think I'll take the plains. And that's what he did. And it says he pitched his tent towards Sodom. Abraham went and lived in the hills. As time went by, one day, when Abram was sitting outside his tent in the, in the new day, heat of the day, he saw some travellers coming towards him. And uh, as was the Eastern custom, when they got close enough, he went out and greeted them. He said, you must be tired and thirsty. Come in, we'll uh, uh, wash your feet and uh, offer you some refreshments. He said to his servants, go and kill the, the, the special lamb or whatever it was that they had there, uh, that they were fattening up. Go and kill that and dress it and, and cook it and we'll make a meal for these visitors. At some stage during the conversation as Abram was sitting down there with his three visitors, at some stage he recognised that these were supernatural visitors. These were heavenly visitors. Because uh, God, or the Lord, who was visiting with, we assume, two angels, had come for two reasons. Firstly, to tell Abraham that he had not forgotten his promise of a son. But there was something else he wanted to tell Abraham about as well. And after they had had their meal and uh, the visitor said, well, we must be continuing on down now, 
And uh, the Lord said to Abraham, and he hesitated, he wondered whether he should tell Abraham this or not, but then he decided he would. And he said to Abraham, the next part of my journey, I'm heading down towards Sodom. In the heavenly courts, I've heard some bad stuff about what's going on in that town. I've come down to see if it's true. And if it's true, I'm going to destroy that place. Abram was immediately upset. That's where his beloved nephew lived. He knew that he lived down there. Didn't see him much these days, but he was down there. And without mentioning names, Abram says to the Lord, Lord, if there are 50 righteous people in that town... Would you destroy that town, that city? The Lord said, no. For 50 people, I, 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 would leave it, I would leave it be. Now, Abram in his mind knew that the chances of 50 were fairly remote down there. He, got, he began to bargain with God. 45, 40, 30, getting really bold. Now, Lord, 20. Finally, he says, Lord, don't be angry with me, but I just we need to lower it to 10. If there are ten righteous people down there in Sodom, will you destroy that city? The Lord said, no, I'll save that city for ten righteous people. Abraham left it at that. He began working out some things on his you know, lot and his wife. He knew there were still two girls at home. He knew there were sons and daughters that had married. There's got to be ten there, surely. There's got to be ten. And so the visitors leave and they walk on down and because they had spent most of that afternoon with Abraham, they arrive at the gates of Sodom in the afternoon, late afternoon, just before it's getting dark, just before they close the city gates. And the two men who we know, uh, who we know were angels uh, walk into the city square, which was right in front of the city gate there. And uh, we know that Lot now has moved from his tent being pitched towards Sodom. He's actually moved into Sodom. He now owns a house in Sodom. Not only that, he's become a man of some standing. He's at the gate. That means he was perhaps the mayor or one of the chief elders of the town. And he comes up to the visitors and says, Welcome to our town. Where are you staying tonight? And the angels say, Oh, we're just going to stay in a subtropical climate uh, in the Jordan Valley there. We're just going to stay in the square for the night. Lot knew that was not a good idea. He knew they wouldn't be safe. He didn't say that to them, but he knew they would not be safe there. You need to come home to my place. No, 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 we'll be right here, they said. And he insisted and took them back to his house where he could keep them in safety. I'm just going to skip over the next bit quite quickly because it's really R-rated, isn't it? It's really quite a shocking story. But you know the story, how the men from the town come knocking on the door and said, send those two visitors out to us. And such was the culture that um, uh, Lot was obliged even to give his life rather than risk the safety of visitors that were in his house. And he said, no, no, don't do this great wickedness. And the men insisted. In the end, Lot said, what say I give you my daughters? I hope the girls didn't hear him say that. Us as parents can't imagine why somebody would say that. Regardless of culture or anything else, if that's their culture, that's a bad culture. <coughs> Fortunately, the men were not interested and uh, Lot shut the door, but the men pressed against the door so heavily they, it seemed like when it was about to break, the angels revealed that they were from heaven and they reached out and they touched those men so that they were all blind and they had to go back to their homes. Then the angels revealed why they were there. They said this town's going to be, this, this town, the city's going to be consumed by God's wrath in the morning. You've got the rest of the night to warn your family they need to get out of this place. So Lot leaves immediately and he goes to his son's place and he says, look, God's going to destroy this place tonight. By the morning, you need, you need to be out of here. And they made fun of him. And he went to his daughter's place and told them the same thing. They said, get out of here, you crazy man. You don't know what you're talking about. Imagine if you were in that position. You believed what the angels had told you. And you knew that town was going to be destroyed that night and everybody that was in it. And your sons and daughters and your grandchildren would not come with you. 
So Lot and his wife delayed as long as they could. They were reluctant to leave because of what they were leaving behind. And eventually the angels grabbed them by the arms. And they towed Lot and his wife and his two daughters out of the town. Don't look behind, head to the hills. A lot manages to negotiate, oh, let's just go to a little town. So he did, he goes to a little town, they all will find later, he did go to the hills. And I imagine they didn't need to look behind because when the, the, the fire and brimstone began raining down on that city, it would have illuminated the night sky. And they didn't need to look behind to see what was happening, but unfortunately Lot's wife did. And she suffered God's judgment as well and turned into a pillar of salt. The next part of the story is very interesting. Again, uh, rape of rape. Lot's daughters decide, they don't decide, they recognize that Lot's name's going to die out. He has no sons now. He's not likely to produce any more sons. And so they work out a plot how they might become pregnant to their father. They'll get him drunk. And first the oldest girl gets pregnant. And then the second girl gets pregnant. And you wonder, you just got to wonder what sort of man was Lot. Interesting to notice where the sons that came from those pregnancies, who they were. One was the forefather of the Moabites, and the other one was the forefather of the Amalekites. Both enemies of Israel, and persecuted Israel in later years. It's interesting, isn't it? But think of Ruth. What was she? She was a Moabite. She married Boaz, who was the great-grandparents of David who was the forefather of Jesus himself. Jesus' ancestry on one side actually went back to Lot. It's an amazing story, isn't it? Have you ever thought of that? I never really thought about that until I studied about this. So if I would ask you this morning, give me the characteristics of Lot. What, what, would, you, what would you tell me? Selfish? That'd be the first one, wouldn't it? Selfish lot. Compromising lot. He was living in a town where he should never have been. Bad father lot. That was a bad father that he would offer his daughter. There'd be no excuse for that in my mind. Drunken lot. Incestuous lot. Is there any good thing about lot that you can think of? I've got a text I want you to look up. Second Peter. Chapter 2, Second Peter chapter 2, verse 7 and verse 8. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, no one said to me a characteristic of Lot was righteous, no one suggested that, Peter's here saying it, if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. I tell you the story this morning, not so that you might think that you are a righteous person and you can do anything you like. I tell you this morning that <coughs> there is hope for everybody. It doesn't matter where you have come from. Now, the Lord certainly will not leave you there. But it doesn't matter where you have come from. Everyone has a chance of being righteous. How important is righteousness? We won't look it up, but Matthew 5.20. Jesus is talking with his disciples, and he says, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you'll have no part of my kingdom. Now, that was a bit of a shock to the, to, the, to the disciples. This was early in Jesus' ministry, and they had still much to learn. But the Pharisees were the most righteous people they knew. 
These were the people that uh, stood on the corners and prayed beautiful prayers. And they went and gave big offerings at the busy time of the temple so that everybody could see how much money they were putting in. These were the people that tied their mint in their tummy. How would you tie your mint plant? I don't know. You don't chop off every tenth stalk, perhaps, and take those not sure. That's how particular they were. And Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that, you will have no part in the kingdom. Well, God's standard is really high. Righteousness is very important. So how do you get righteousness? I want to tell you another story this morning that I um, that I read just recently. And the name of the man is Robert Robinson. Lived quite a few years ago. In fact, he was born in 1735 in England. And this was the era of the Wesleys. You know, John and Charles Wesley, Whitcliffe, Whitfield, tremendous evangelists and preachers. Now, he wasn't as famous as those preachers, but he was a considered preacher, evangelist, pastor of his day. Gave his heart to the Lord early in life. Uh, he also was a poet and a hymn writer. And uh, he was well considered by his congregation, but somehow, somewhere along the line, he lost his experience with the Lord and he left the ministry. And he actually went to live in Paris. And there he mixed with the socialites of, of Paris and uh, lived the life of a, of a person who had given up the Lord. One night as he was coming home in his carriage, after being at some social event, he was with one of the socialite Parisian ladies in the carriage, and she had recently become a Christian. And she was reading a poem. And uh, we know what the poem was. I've got it right here. She said, uh, Robert, I want you to give me opinion on this poem. And she read it to him, and here it is. Come, thou fount of every blessing, Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore thee. May I still my goodness prove. While the hope of endless glory fills my heart with joy and love. And she lifted her eyes to look into the face of Robert to get his comment and she saw tears streaming down his face. She said, what's the matter, Robert? I was just wanting your opinion on this poem. He said, I know that poem well. He said, when I was a man of 23, I wrote that poem. He said, I've lost my way and I don't know how to find my way back. She replied to him, you do know how to find your way back. It's there in the third line. Streams of mercy never ceasing. You know the answer yourself, you wrote that. And even here on this Parisian night, God's mercy is flowing just as it ever has, and it's enough for you. He gave his heart back to the Lord that day and served him for the remainder of his years. He died a relatively young man of 56 years old. How do we obtain righteousness? That was the question that I was asking. I've got a text that I want you to look up this morning. Philippians 3 verse 9. Two texts that I want you to look up actually. We'll start off with Philippians 3 verse 9. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through Christ. The righteousness that comes from God is by faith. Another text, Romans 10, verse 2 and 3. Romans 10, verse 2 and 3. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God. Now he's talking about the Pharisees that we've just mentioned before. Right? But their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness.
How do we obtain righteousness? It's our third question. How important is righteousness? Essential if you're planning for the kingdom. What is righteousness? We haven't really answered that question yet. Let me tell you what I would give you as a definition of righteousness. When Adam and Eve were created, they were created righteous. And had they been obedient, their offspring would have been righteous. However, they sinned, and righteous, they lost their righteousness. It was no longer there. But God said, not all is lost. I can give you righteousness of my own account. See, when God made us, he made us in his own image. And so he wants us to behave like him, to think like him, to act like him. To be holy is righteous, or righteousness. That's what righteousness is. And God says, I'm sorry, but you can't be like that yourself. You cannot make up your own righteousness like the Pharisees were trying to do. That's what Paul's talking about in Romans. They tried to make up their own righteousness. And Paul says in Philippians, you can't make up your own righteousness. It's a gift from God. And you simply accept it by faith. I call this the three R's. When I went to school, it was important you learn the three R's. You know, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And like I said last week, by the time you finished your schooling, you learned that two of those words weren't written like that anyway, if you could learn to write. They were the basics of education, weren't they? And then, you know, I left school with a reasonable understanding of those things, and I'm considered educated, I suppose. I know how to read, write, and do basic sums. But there are three R's for righteousness. The first one is repentance. That was the story about Robert I told you this morning. Repentance. The second one is redemption and restoration. God comes in and restores. Let me give you an example of that this morning. There was a man by the name of Peter Cropper. He was a very skilled violinist. And um, in 1981, so it's not an all that story, not all that old. I'm sure I may have disposed of it, but not all that old. Like, it's not like 1700s. Uh, he was asked by the, um, uh, by the Royal Academy of Music in London to play the violin uh, with some concerts that they were coming up were coming up. But greater than that, uh, you would have heard of Antonio Stradivarius. He's the man in the 1700s that made those beautiful violins. And um, there are still some of them around today, and they'll cost you hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, to buy one. Their sound that they produced was exquisite. And uh, to own one of these, is, and to play one of these, is an experience of a lifetime for those people uh, who can play the violin. They said to him, we want you to come and play with the Royal Academy of Music here in London and we're going to give you a Stradivarius to play. He was absolutely ecstatic and excited. This was the highlight of his career. And uh, as he was walking in for practice, uh, with violin in hand, he tripped. And he fell on the violin. And he broke it. He broke the neck of it. And he was absolutely distraught to think that he had done this damage to this priceless violin. There was a master craftsman somewhere there in London and he took it to him and he said, I'll see what I can do with it. And he repaired the violin. And uh, when he handed it back, it was impossible to detect where it, had been, where it had been broken. The sound was exactly the same as it used to make. And uh, the academy, uh, let him continue to let him use it. That was generous of him, was it? And uh, he eventually played in, in the concert that they were uh, that they were preparing for. But that's restoration and redemption. That's the second hour. That's what God wants to do to you. You come to him and repent. He won't leave you where you are. He will redeem you. He will restore you. He will make you like new. How does he do that? 
He will change your habits in your lifetime, but he comes and he places a robe of his righteousness over you. And it makes you look just like God. It makes you look perfection. Now that statement might be seemingly a little bit rash, just like God, but it is actually God's righteousness. That's why you look like him, you're not him. But you look like him. Because it's his clothing. I want to read to you, um, to finish off here this morning, the third R. I've got papers here everywhere, and I know I've put it somewhere. Here it is. This is a little story I found. <coughs> this is the third R for righteousness. Some stories are best told, and I usually like to tell a story, and some stories are best read. This is one of those stories that needs to be read. It's about Philip's egg. Philip was born with Down syndrome. He was a pleasant child, happy it seemed, but increasingly aware of the difference between himself and other children. Philip went to Sunday school faithfully every week. He was in the third grade class with nine other eight-year-olds. You know eight-year-olds. And Philip, with his differences, was not readily accepted. But his teacher was sensitive to Philip, and he helped this group of eight-year-olds to love each other as best they could under the circumstances. They learned, they laughed, they played together. And they really cared about one another, even though eight-year-olds don't say they care about one another out loud. But don't forget, there was an exception to all this. Philip was not really a part of the group. Philip did not choose, nor did he want to be different, he just was. And that was the way things were. His teacher had a marvellous idea for his class one Sunday. You know those things that pantyhose come in, the containers that look like great big eggs? The teacher collected ten of them. The children loved it when he brought them into the room and gave one to each child. It was a beautiful spring day, and the assignment was for each child to go outside, find the symbol for a new life, put it into the egg, and bring it back to the classroom. They would then open and share the new life symbols and surprises one by one. It was glorious, it was confusing, it was wild. They ran all around the church grounds, gathering their symbols, and returned to the classroom. They put all the eggs on a table, and then the teacher began to open them. All the children gathered round the table, he opened one, and there was a flower. They ooed and ahed, he opened another, and there was a little butterfly. Beautiful, the girls all said, since it was hard for eight-year-old boys to say beautiful. He opened another, and there was a rock. And as third graders, well, some laughed and some said, that's crazy. How's a rock supposed to be like new life? But the smart little boy who put it in there spoke up. That's mine. And I knew all you would get flowers and buds and leaves and butterflies and stuff like that. So I got a rock because I wanted to be different. And for me, that's new life. They all laughed. The teacher said something about the wisdom of eight-year-olds and opened the next one. There was nothing inside. The children as eight-year-olds will said, that's not fair, that's stupid, someone didn't do it right. Then the teacher filled a tug on his shirt and looked down. It's mine, Philip said, it's mine. And the children said, you don't ever do things right, Philip, there's nothing there. I did so do it right, Philip said, I did do it right. The tomb is empty. There was silence, a very full silence. And for you people who don't believe in miracles, I want to tell you that one happened that day. From that time on, it was different. Philip suddenly became a part of that group of eight-year-old children. They took him in. He was set free from the tomb of his differentness. Philip died last summer. His family had known since the time he was born that he wouldn't live out a full lifespan. Many other things were wrong with his little body. And so late last July, with an infection that most normal children could have quickly shrugged off, Philip died. At his memorial service, nine eight-year-old children marched up to the altar, not with flowers to cover over the stark reality of death, but nine eight-year-olds, along with their Sunday school teacher, marched right up to that altar and laid on it an empty egg, an empty old, discarded, handy hose egg, and the tomb was empty. That's the last hour. Belief in a resurrection. In a risen Jesus. 
we can repent and we can be rehabilitated, but unless there was a resurrection, it would all be pointless. And so I recommend to you Jesus today and his righteousness, because he offers that gift to all of us, a gift which we accept by faith to anybody who would want to enter. I've chosen for our final hymn today, in case you haven't realized, number 334. This is the song that Robert Robinson wrote, and it's the rest of the hymn. I read out the first verse in that poem. I want you to stand and sing it this morning, and uh, think of God's repentance, his restoration, his resurrection, and I guess there's another R, his return. Thank you. those that have not accepted that so far, that they will do so this morning. And that they will receive your restoration <coughs> and the benefit of your resurrection and be ready for your return. I pray in Jesus' name.